Okay, it's time to start the webinar. Konnichiwa, namaste, and hello everyone. And welcome to this webinar. Thank you for joining us today for another exciting webinar about study and work in Japan session 22. My name is Sakshi Roy and I'm the program assistant here with the University of Tokyo India office and I'll be facilitating today's webinar. So uh, we are very happy to have you all here and we are going to start out with a brief introduction uh, about our studying work in Japan project. So we are the part of Japan Global Network project in Southwest Asia by MEXT and our aim is to promote studying in Japan in order to attract the region's excellent student to higher education and research in Japan on behalf of all the Japanese universities through collaboration and networking between overseas region offices. Um, so being a part of a Global 30 project, we provide comprehensive information on Japanese universities at free of cost. We organize education fairs and seminars throughout India and we manage committees for coordinator for study in Japan as well. So today is the 22nd day of this webinar series. So the Ministry of Education, Culture, Sports, Science and Technology in Japan. Um, by means of all these sessions, our mission is to introduce Japanese universities to you and to assist you to study and work in Japan. So uh, without further ado, let me share with you our agenda for today. So uh, today's webinar is scheduled for two hours. And first, we are going to see presentation by Mr. Ray Takahashi, which will be followed by the presentation by representatives of three different Japanese universities, which are Ritsumikan Asia Pacific University, Tokyo International University, and Yokohama National University. And in the last, uh, we'll see a special presentation by Japan Science and Technology Agency. So each university will have a presentation time of 20 minutes. And after each presentation, uh, we have a time for Q&A session of five minutes. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping before we jump into the webinar itself. There is a Q&A pane or a Q&A feature within your Zoom panel. So please, uh, during the webinar, please go ahead and submit your questions to the Q&A panel and not in the chat box. I repeat, please not to use the chat box for submitting your queries please submit to the Q&A box because our panelists will be going to looking into the Q&A box to answer your questions. So without further delay, let's start with the presentation on overview of study and work in Japan by Mr. Ray Takahashi from the University of Tokyo, Bangladesh office. So Mr. Takahashi, I request you to please proceed with your presentation with all of us. Give me a moment, please. <clears throat> um, I hope it's visible. Not now. Not yet. Okay. Is it okay. visible now? Perfect. All right, all right. Um, <clears throat> hello, everyone. Um, apologies for the delay. So good afternoon, good evening for some to all of our respective viewers and um, all of our um, respected universities who were, <clears throat> we're very more, uh, more than happy and delighted to see a wonderful um, panelist and uh, lots of viewers joining us today. So I am Ray Takahashi and today I'm working in Japan. Okay. <clears throat> So I think the number one question, the number one question you, um, you guys are having is, why should I choose Japan? So Japan is one of those countries which needs no um, additional introduction. Everyone knows Japan and Japan is a very lucrative option um, for all of our students who are wishing to study abroad, right? So I think there are lots of things to, uh, we can talk about in length, a lot of things about why we should choose Japan. So we have Japan is technologically very advanced and is one of the highest. And if I'm being specific, it's the third largest economy in the world, right? It's very safe. The food is amazing. The people are amazing. The culture is amazing, right? And the list goes on. So <clears throat> I think it's very self-explanatory and we have, um, it's also in the slide, but I think we can talk about a few things which are not in the slide, right? 
So this is not my opinion, but if you consider Japan to be your destination, then it is um, worthy to mention that Japan is one of the safest country in the world. And by when I say safest, I mean it's ranked number nine in the Global Peace Index, right? So <clears throat> I won't bore you with the details, but as you can see, Japan has a lot of options. So if you're a student who just graduated high school or college and is looking for undergraduate, Japan could be a very lucrative option for you. And Japan also has higher studies opportunities and potentials, as you can see, we have graduate masters, right? And we also have like postdoc and doctorals, right? So um, Japanese universities are divided largely into three categories, the national, which is run by the government. And we also have public universities and also we have private universities as well. All right, so, <clears throat> You might ask me like, what, how do I start or <clears throat> what is the process? I think the process is very self-explanatory. If you want to get into a bachelor's course, you have to take the common entrance exam. And I want to assure you here to all of my viewers is the number one misconception we have about Japan is if I want to study in Japan, I have to learn Japanese language. I'm here to assure you, I will talk about it in details, but I'm here to assure you that there are programs which is taught in English, right? <clears throat> All right, so um, <clears throat> when you want to go for master's and PhD courses, at first, what you have to do is you have to contact with your supervisor, right? And that supervisor will guide you with the um, rest of the process. And here, um, this is very important. And as we've mentioned, the Jap Japan is one of the most lucrative options to study, in, right? So we might have an assumption that Japan is very, very expensive and the tuition fees will be expensive as well. So as you can see, this is not my opinion. These are data that Japanese universities are not that expensive. I'm here to tell you Japanese universities are not that expensive. And we've compared it with um, the United States, which is also one of the most lucrative options. So when we, when we compare side to side, you can see that the public university tuition fee is so little compared to the United States. And I'm here to tell you that um, as South Asian country or as a fellow South Asian member, um, we have, when we say um, study abroad destination, US is one of our most popular choices. And when we compare one of the most popular choices with Japan, you can see that Japan is very, very less expensive. Tuition fees public, tuition fees private, right? But um, this is where it gets complicated that living expense is actually a little bit high in Japan, right? But I'm here, uh, we will talk about it in details. I'm here to assure you that you don't have to worry about that that much. Okay, so here you can see the job opportunities in Japan. So you might ask me that, um, okay, Takai-san, um, we can go to Japanese universities, but can we get a job there? Yes, you can get a job there very easily. And the job prospect is huge. The job prospect is huge. And it's really easy to get a visa, right? So we also have another misconception regarding Japan. And also with other countries is that we might go to study there. It's a huge investment, but we have to come back to our own country after our studying is over, or after our study visa is over, right? I can tell you, and I can also assure you that in case of Japan, visa procurement is not that hard. You can actually get a job after you graduate, right? And um, you can see here the average salary after you graduate is 3.9 million yen per year. So even if the expense is very high in Japan, which is actually true, your income will be very high as well. Right. So here we can see the leading Japanese companies and you can also see other global companies which are operating in Japan. And uh, we'll talk about it in details. But what I want you to understand here is that when I summarize it, <clears throat> um, I would say the number one point to take away from here is that there are programs taught in English. Right. And number two, getting a job after you graduate is not that hard when it comes to Japan, right? You can change your visa. You can actually stay in Japan while you work in Japan. All right, 
Now, uh, another question you might be asking, who are you, right? Who are you to tell us this? Um, I am Ray Takahashi, right? <clears throat> Sorry for the delay in introduction. So I'm actually half Japanese and half Bangladeshi, right? So my mother is Japanese and my father is Bangladeshi. And I'm actually living in Japan, uh, Bangladesh for the last 20 years. So I, I am, I'm also related in like the coordinating field. So I coordinate Japanese projects operating in Bangladesh. And currently I'm working as the regional coordinator in the University of Tokyo Bangladesh office. So why does it matter or what does it actually mean? It means that um, <clears throat> there is a huge demand, right? I'm going to talk about it in details. There's a huge demand in people like me. And for those of you who are actually interested in studying in Japan, when you go to Japan, when you study in their universities and when you graduate, you actually get a lot of additional skills, which is what? You actually know the language. So your Japanese language proficiency will be high. And you already have a high English language proficiency, which is also a very good bonus. And what actually matters is that you have the local knowledge and the know-hows, right? So I'm going to summarize why does it matter? So um, we have our South Asian friends. You might be from India, you might be from Bangladesh, you might be from Sri Lanka. And Japan is actually looking to invest in a lot of these countries, right? Especially in the manufacturing, IT and agricultural sectors. They want to open up their manufacturing hubs or they want to open up branch, uh, branch <clears throat> branches of their company in these countries. So you are already from those countries. You have the lo uh, local knowledge and you also have the local market um, knowledge. That makes you a very lucrative option or a very attractive employee to these Japanese companies. So I would um, summarize is that people like me and when you study in Japan and when you graduate from those universities, you would be one of the uh, most lucrative options for Japanese companies. So they will be more than willing to hire you, right? So um, <clears throat> that will be all from my end. And I'm sure you might have some questions. Please um, do not hesitate and ask us in the question, as Ms. Sakshi mentioned, do not hesitate to um, ask me any question or ask us any questions in the question box. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Takashi. Thank you for your guidance and for such a motivating presentation. I hope by listening to your experience, uh, it will help students to consider studies in Japan. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Takashi, can you please share the agenda slide? Please give me a moment. <clears throat> so I hope it's visible. Not now. Okay, it's visible now. Okay, so uh, now let's uh, move on to our next presentation uh, on Ritsumakan Asia Pacific University. So before moving forward, I'll share a brief introduction about the Ritsumakan Asia Pacific University. APU is one of the top international private institutions in Japan. The university has a fully English-based curriculum within a uniquely multicultural environment. And most importantly, Ritsumakan APU have their own career centers which offers a variety of career planning events and placement support services for students. I strongly encourage you all to take advantage of the opportunity to plan your future by choosing you as a future of career option. So now I'm gonna hand things over to uh, Ms. Ishana from APU India office. Here is an insight into Ms. Ishana. Thank you the very kind um may i share my screen yes please okay. i hope it's visible yes okay great so picking up from what um, Ms. sakshi was explaining um we are ritsumikan asia pacific university we're located in a small town called beppu i'll get to the map later um, campus. It's on a beautiful hilltop and overlooking the Pacific Ocean with a lot of greenery, as you can see. Um, and as Ms. Sakshi said, we uh, do offer all our courses in English. So you don't need to know uh, any Japanese language prior to coming to our university. Um, so this is what the numbers looks like. We have 
5,700 students and we're mostly um, for graduate with 5,500 students, but we also have 200 seats for master's and PhD programs. So it gets a bit more competitive to get a seat um, at the graduate level. Um, we have, um, what makes us very unique is that we have uh, 47 to 50% international students. We're usually at 50%, but because of the pandemic, we, we've seen a very slight uh, dip, but I'm sure we'll be back there soon. So we, we usually have students coming in from 90 different countries, including India. And just to give you a sense, we at any given point, we have about 80 Indian students on campus. So you'd get to make friends from a lot of other countries, as well as people um, back from your home country, too. We have um, faculty coming in from several regions. You'll have uh, faculty and teachers coming from the US, from Europe, Africa, various Asian countries, et cetera. So there's a lot of diversity. And um, we also have a very strong alumni network in all these various regions. So we are a private university owned by the Ritsumikan Trust. Um, the Ritsumikan Trust also has another university called Ritsumikan University. So that, that one is located in Kyoto and we are located in Beppu. Um, and a lot of times student students tend to get confused. So I just thought I'd clarify that to begin with. Although we operate under the same trust, uh, we do operate as two entirely different universities with a separate admission, um, admission process. So we are ranked by Times Higher Education uh, World Rankings as 22nd in Japan out of 800 universities overall and fifth out of um, the private universities. And this is a really huge achievement for us in particular because we're an extremely young university. We were formed in the year 2000. So we're just 21 um, years old right now. And to be recognized in um, prestigious global rankings is um, you know, a huge achievement for a young university. So we, um, we are located, as I mentioned, in Beppu. So it's in the southernmost island called Kyushu. Um, the biggest uh, city next to Beppu is Fukuoka, if you've heard of that. And of course, everyone knows Tokyo. So we're just um, basically a one and a half hour flight from Tokyo. And we are a mid-sized city, which is 1,20,000 people. So extremely safe, also pretty affordable. It's not as expensive as, um, you know, the major business cities. And we're also known as a popular tourist destination for onsens, which are hot springs. So we have two colleges at, at APU. Um, uh, we have APM, which is the College of International Management. And this is at the undergraduate level. So you can pursue a Bachelor of Business Administration here. And the other college that we have is called APS, which is the College of Asia Pacific Studies, where you can pursue a Bachelor of Social Sciences degree here. And our degrees are for duration, um, like other universities in Japan, uh, we follow the US uh, system. So um, in, in your four years, you can choose between uh, the specializations that we offer. So if you're taking APM, you'll have accounting and finance, management, marketing, innovation, and economics. And then there's a whole plethora of um, subjects under these specializations that you can choose from, a lot of optional subjects. And um, just to say that your specialization is not something you need to choose right in the beginning, we give you the flexibility to choose your specialization right up until your fourth year. So let's say if you start off by taking accounting and finance, but you don't feel that accounting is suiting you, then you can swap to marketing or to innovation and economics whenever you like. And the same goes for APS, which is for social sciences. Um, so here, I'd just like to highlight that uh, we have um, received accreditation from um, AACSB, which is the Association to Collegiate Schools of Business. And um, we um, basically only the top 5% of business schools in the world receive this accreditation. Some of the other schools include Harvard, Stanford, et cetera. And this gives us connections with um, all of the top business schools. Um, and also we have uh, a lot of focus on uh, industry learning. So you're not only going to be stuck in a classroom or you know, listening to lectures, you're going to be out there working with industry. We have business case competitions. Um, we have a lot of programs going on. We have business clubs. 
So um, essentially, you can be put together in teams, you can be traveling for field studies, you can be um, presenting to companies on uh, solving real life challenges for them. Um, so there's a lot of interesting things going on. And at uh, the College of Asia Pacific Studies, these are the various disciplines that we offer, the specializations, and same way you can swap from one to the other. Here we have received special recognition for our hospitality and tourism course. Um, it's accredited by the UN's World Tourism Organization, but we're equally strong in, in all four of these specializations. And here typically we have students, again, we have a lot of practical learning. Um, you know, we have hands-on research work, field studies, um, you know, competitions, et cetera, and a lot of student clubs focused on environment, focused on media, uh, international relations. So a lot of our students go on to work for the United Nations. They go on to work for with um, in diplomacy, so working for um, ministries of uh, foreign affairs, et cetera, um, and of course, even with the global advertising agencies, et cetera. Um, so we have, uh, as we mentioned, courses are offered in English, and then we have uh, Japanese students who uh, come in and are learning English. So basically everyone can speak the same two languages, English and Japanese. In your first year, you'd be learning Japanese language um, at the undergraduate level, and it's pretty intensive, but trust me, it'll really help you with getting part-time jobs and then even getting employed by the end of your degree. Um, so... Okay, so we have um, on-campus housing where we either have a shared room or with a dividing door in between so you get your privacy or it's a single room. We try in, to, in, uh, to encourage you to make friends with um, you know, a Japanese local student. We would try to make an international student like yourself or be roommates with a Japanese local so that you know you can the Japanese student can learn English from you you can learn practice your Japanese with the Japanese student and they can help you around if ever you want to travel and you want some advice they can help you out and then second year onwards you move off campus um, where you can share an apartment with your friends so where the cost over here is about um, on, on campus it might be about 35,000 rupees or 30,000 rupees a month. Um, when you move off campus and you're sharing with friends, depends on the number of friends you share with, but let's say if you're sharing with four friends, it comes down to about 17,000 rupees a month. So, um, you know, it, basically your cost of living reduces after the first deal. Um, part-time jobs are plenty. You can get on-campus and off-campus uh, part-time jobs and they pay pretty well. So a lot of students report that they're able to cover their cost of living thanks to the part-time jobs. We have a vibrant student life, so 110 different student clubs that you can join, be it um, you know, sports, or food clubs, or arts, any uh, volunteering, any such thing, you're bound to find something you enjoy. So coming to scholarships, we have an APU tuition reduction scholarship ranging from 30% to 100%. Um, and these are given, they're awarded to you at the time of admission and you are able to secure it for all four years of your uh, degree. Um, so this is what it looks like. Our usual cost of attendance would be about 9 lakh rupees if you didn't get any scholarship. But let's say if you got a 65% scholarship, your tuition fee would come down to 3 lakh rupees. And then when you add it with all your living expenses, we've taken a little higher estimate of living expenses. We've not accounted for any part-time job that you might be securing. So um, that's why it looks a bit high at, at 7 lakhs. But um, let's say with your tuition reduction scholarship, it might be about 13 lakhs per year for you. Um, that is if you're not covering your cost, of, if you choose not to take a part-time job and let's say you just want to, you know, engage in student clubs, etc., then this is what it would look like. And of course, our scholarships go up to 100% as well. We have other, uh, other uh, scholarships available once you're on campus. So the Ando scholarship, the Justo scholarship are scholarships that Indian students have received. And these pay you um, sometimes a monthly fee that can cover your cost of living. This is available from your second year onwards. So we also have exchange partners. So you can do a semester or a year abroad in one in choose from 150 exchange partners of ours, and your scholarship will apply here too. 
So we have a 96% job placement rate. It's not to say that 4% were not employed. It's just that they've not reported back to us about what they're doing. They may have gone back home to work in their family business, et cetera. We're not so sure. Um, but it is a very, very high placement rate. We have more than 200 companies coming to our campus, especially to recruit students. So even though we're a small town, you don't need to feel like you have to travel to Tokyo or Osaka to get interviews, but rather, you know, you get approached by companies. So these are some of our major employers, Dentsu and United Nations, um, Apple. I, I know an Indian student who was working with Apple, um, Google. So you have all the big M MNCs that you may have heard of, as well as startups that we've not listed here. Um, and these are some of the graduate schools. So once you've, once you've completed your undergraduate degree, you can get placed at a you know, top, uh, top business school or top university for your master's. So this is our application schedule. Um, so we have two intakes every year, April and September. And um, you mostly Indian students tend to apply for the September enrollment. Uh, don't worry about memorizing these dates because we'll try and share the slides with you after this and you can get in touch. So we have two stages of the application. It's very straightforward. There's an online application form and an online assessment that you need to take. That's called stage one. Once you pass stage one, there's a 15 minute interview that we conduct, which is very, very important for your scholarship. Um, and then, uh, and this is conducted on Zoom. And then once you pass that stage, we, we offer you admission and we let you know what scholarship we're able to offer you. So um, our online application requires four essays. We require your um, mark sheets from your 10th, 11th and 12th grade. We need a letter of recommendation from your school. Um, and we need a language proficiency test for English. This is very important. The only upfront fee that you pay at the time of applying is about 3,800 rupees. And we also look at extracurricular activities that you're able to submit. We don't need you to submit SAT or any of those other standardized tests. But if you happen to have taken an SAT, please do feel free to share your results and we can consider it. Also, if you happen to have, if you're taking GLPT exams, um, let's say you've given your N4, et cetera, please feel free to mention that in your application because um, it could provide you with a slight advantage. Um, and then we, this is the um, English proficiency options that you have, there's TOEFL, IELTS, and we also accept Duolingo. So you can take any one of these tests, but um, here are the cutoffs for IELTS at 6.0, TOEFL at 7. 75. Duolingo, we don't have a cutoff yet. That's why the one, um, uh, the one drawback is that if you submit Duolingo, you also need to submit a form filled by your English teacher. Coming to the graduate school, so we have um, a master in Asia Pacific Studies and we offer international relations and society and culture. And then we have a master in international cooperation policy. Um, where these are the various specializations. Uh, this is, again, our social sciences uh, school, graduate school. So here we don't require any prior work experience. You can enroll here right, right when you graduate your undergraduate degree. Um, we also have a dual degree program called IMAT, which is one year in Japan and one year in Germany, and it's focused on sustainability science. Um, and we have a PhD in Asia Pacific Studies. So our graduate schools, they're, um, they're two-year degrees, or the master's, and the PhD is a three-year program. Um, this is our graduate school of management where we offer the MBA program. And here are the various specializations. Um, again, a two-year degree, but please do note that um, we have a very strict entry criteria where we need you to have three years a work experience full time. So it doesn't count if you've been doing an internship during your undergraduate degree for three years, that's not gonna make the cut. We need you to have graduated three years ago and have had three years of full-time work experience in order to apply. And I know it's a, a strict requirement, but um, we, we do, because of our accreditations, we do have to fall in line with those requirements to, so as to keep those accreditations and keep our rankings. So. Yeah, and this is a cost of graduate school. Um, again, don't, don't feel compelled to take this down. It's all on our website. Um, so the, and we have a lot of generous 
scholarships even more so at the master's level. So 90, 98% of international students tend to get a scholarship, um, you know, and since it's only a two year degree, there's a lot more scholarships available. And um, again, all our classes are taught in English. Here we do not, um, we do not teach Japanese language. It's completely optional. You can take classes on the side if you like. Um, and there are a lot of external scholarships like MEXT, Asian Development Bank, and more. Some of these can cover 100% of your tuition as well as your living costs. Yeah, so this is, um, this is something that we, we recently announced. So we are one of 37 universities to be able to offer a two-year visa for aspiring student entrepreneurs. So if you are looking to start a business, um, you can basically have two years through this visa to go ahead and start your business. You don't need a letter from a company saying that you're hired and thus you're able to stay back in Japan with an extended visa. So, okay, so these are contact details. So I'm Ishana based in Mumbai, um, but I cover, um, I cover all cities outside of Delhi NCR and I have a colleague based in Delhi who covers uh, the Delhi NCR region. These are some of our links um, and you can get to know further information and please follow us on social media if you want to know what's happening on our campus because we have a lot of things going on. Yeah. Thank you and open to any questions that you might have. Thank you, Ms. Ishana. Thank you uh, so much for your presentation. It was nothing short of incredibly informative and interesting. So now we can start the Q&A session for five minutes. And there are a few questions which is specifically related to the APU in the, the Q&A box. So I request you to please uh, go through them and pick up question one by one to answer. Okay, so I'm not too sure if all of these are directed at me. Um, we can take the questions from the bottom of the q and box. That's a good idea. Okay, so APU two years post-study work visa for BBA students also. Um, so you do, you are able to convert your student visa into a work visa if you have a job. Um, if you're talking about the entrepreneurship visa, yes, it is um, available for, um, for bachelor's graduates as well, not only for master's graduates. Um, does APU offer STEM-related undergraduate courses? I'm so sorry, but we, we don't. We're only focused on business and uh, liberal arts at the moment, um, social sciences, but maybe in the future, who knows? Um, okay, one second. What's the eligibility for enrollment in international relations as I'm currently doing master's in Japanese studies? So, um, so okay, so we don't, our, our eligibility is based on your, um, your marks. So we look at your last three years of education. We won't be, um, we, we don't actually judge what background you come from. So even if you're doing Japanese studies and you want to go into international relations, um, there's nothing that will hold you back. We just see that you're a good student and, um, you know, we check your English proficiency. We test you through the interview, et cetera. Um, it's it's not to do with what you studied before, but more to see how dedicated and how consistent you've been as a student. And that's a good question because um, maybe I didn't get to mention that, um, let's say if currently if you're a high school student and you studied, um, you take course, but you want to, at APU, you want to study social sciences, it's not a problem at all. And same goes for the other way around. And this applies to both the undergraduate and master's. Okay. Um, um, if I have completed two or 2.5 years of working prior to applying for MBA, will that be considered since I might be completing three years prior? Yes. So if you, if you will have completed three years of working prior to joining APU, then that will be considered. So at the time of applying, if, if it's at 2.5 years, that will be perfectly fine. Okay. Is work experience compulsory for all graduate courses? No, only for the MBA program. So not for the um, social sciences. Is there any entrance exam for getting admission in graduate programs in engineering? I'm sorry, we don't have engineering. Um, but just, just to answer the first part, we don't have any 
particular entrance exam for getting admission. Um, yeah, I think that's all for me. Can you tell me about masters in economics and how to apply for it? So um, you can get in touch with me separately and I'll, I'll guide you through the process. I'm just gonna drop my contact details in the um, chat box and I can help you out with that. We also have a lot of webinars specifically for graduates. You can ask questions on how to boost your application. Are there scholarships available for students who have PR of Japan? Um, yes, there would be some scholarships, though I'm not so familiar because um, I, handle, I handle students who are from India and all of them don't have residency status from Japan, but then there might just be some scholarships available. You can write to me and I'll, I'll check with my colleagues and get back to you. Uh, please let me know acceptance rate. Also, how many students get scholarships? 50% question mark. So um, I'd say 90% of students who apply get a scholarship. On average, I've noticed Indian students getting a 65% scholarship at the undergraduate level. Um, but that being said, like there are a lot of students who get 80 and 100% as well. So, um, yeah. And our acceptance rate is pretty high. We require you to get a 60% 60, 60 consistently in your last three years of education, which is not a very high requirement, but obviously for the scholarships, it can get a little competitive. So you wouldn't need to just get 60%. You need to score higher if you're aiming for the better scholarships. Can I switch international relations to innovation and economics so you can't swap from APS to APM that is swapping from social sciences to um to management or uh, once you choose your degree you're either choosing BBA or Bachelor of Social Sciences once you choose your degree change that so so I hope I've answered your question but you can change to any other um, specialization within the degree that you've chosen Yeah, I think I've answered. Oh, GMAT is needed? No, we don't require GMAT. And study gap is okay as long as you can show us um, how you kept yourself busy and productive in the study gap. But you would need your three years of work experience. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Ashana. Uh, I guess you have answered most of the questions. So thank you for your time and for guiding the students and for all our attendees, in case if you have any further doubts, you can directly contact the Ritsumikan Asia Pacific University. So contact details have been already uh, shared during the presentation. Um, again, I request Ms. Ishana to please uh, share the important links and contact details in the chat box for students. Yes, thank you so much, Ms. Sakshi. Thank you, thank you. all. Thank you very much once again. Yeah, can we have the agenda slide, please? Thank you. So now let's move forward to the presentation uh, by Tokyo International University. So let me give you a brief introduction about the university. So Tokyo International University is a private university in Japan, provides a wide range of study abroad programs, including an English-based undergraduate degree, providing majors in business economics, digital business and innovation, and international relations. In addition, TIU provides career guidance for students looking for, looking for internships and job opportunities in Japan at its well-staffed career development office on campus. So today we have Mr. Ben, the admission counselor. He will be sharing 20 minutes presentation about Tokyo International University. Mr. Ben, I request you to please share your slides with us. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone else uh, for joining us today. Uh, I think this is really exciting um, and it's really great to hear from all the other presenters as well. Um, but I'll go ahead and just get started on my presentation. All right, I hope everyone can see my screen. Yes, it's perfect. Thank you. Perfect. Fantastic. 
All right. Well, um, as was mentioned, my name is Ben, and I am here representing Tokyo International University, specifically our undergraduate English track program for the 2022 uh, admission year. Um, so I'll go ahead and jump right in. So, oh, but Tokyo International University um, is a university that's located in the greater Tokyo metro area about a 30 minute train ride uh, from the city center of Tokyo in an area called Kawagoi. And our university was founded in 1965. However, our English track program, which is the program that houses the vast majority of our international students, began just six years ago in 2015. Now, this English track program originally had around 40 international students, and in these past six years, that has grown to over 1,300, and they make up about a fifth of our student body at the moment. These 1,300 international students come from 68 countries around the world, um, including a number of students from Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, India, Nepal, um, and many other countries around the world as well. We actually have representatives from every continent on Earth. This is really great, we feel, because it gives you a really diverse perspective in the classroom because you're always going to be with a number of different students from different backgrounds. On top of this, we also have an extremely diverse international faculty as well. Around 65% of our faculty come from outside of Japan, and they come from all around the world as well. So we have professors from the US, from Kenya, from Canada, from France, from Syria, Turkey, Indonesia, India, Sri Lanka, um, Taiwan, Korea. So you're going to be getting kind of those diverse viewpoints and that really important kind of global perspective from both your professors and your fellow students as well. I did mention that we are located about 30 minutes by train from the city center of Tokyo. However, uh, for many of you who would be looking to join our university, we have really important news. We're opening up a brand new campus right in the city center of Tokyo in an area called Ikebukuro. This is going to be our global campus. So for the vast majority of our international students, this is where they'll be, where they'll be taking their classes. All of our English track courses will take place here. And we're opening it in 2023, so about two years uh, from September of uh, this year. Um, so for many of you who will be joining us next year, this is where you will be taking classes your, um, I guess, at the very earliest, your sophomore year and above. So this is really exciting, and I think it'll provide a lot of opportunities, particularly when you're maybe job hunting uh, post-university. So we'd like to talk a little bit about Tokyo. You know, um, Mr. Takahashi gave that wonderful presentation about why Japan is such a great place to study. You know, it's extremely safe. Um, it's, you know, surprisingly affordable compared to a lot of other places. But we like to talk about why we think Tokyo itself is such a great place for students. Um, it's been ranked as one of as the second best student city in the world by QS Magazine multiple years in a row. And this is due to a combination of factors. You know, there's really great and reliable public transportation. So there's trains everywhere and also, you know, subways, buses, metro. Um, <clears throat> on top of that, it's just a really fun city for students to live in. You know, there's kind of a little bit of everything for you to do. And then also, I think something that should be pointed out is that it's surprisingly affordable compared to other large cities around the world like London or New York or Sydney. So it's actually a really great place for you as a student. And as somebody that has done uh, part of their undergraduate career in Tokyo, I can just say from personal experience, it's a really great place to study. Now, moving on to our undergraduate programs. Um, our English track program has three majors, as were mentioned before. We have a BA in Business Economics, a Bachelor of Science in Digital Business and Innovation, and a Bachelor of Arts in International Relations as well. Now, all of our degrees are four years, uh, kind of that's the standard path, although we do have a, an early graduation option for high achieving students. And all of the degrees are taught in English, as this is our E-Track or English Track program. Um, so we don't require any Japanese before you come about that. Um, and then you can take some Japanese classes once you get here. Um, now, today I'm here to talk about our undergraduate program primarily. We do have graduate degree programs in all of these majors as well. Um, however, I'll give a little bit more information on that at the end, including who you can uh, reach out to to talk about that. But why don't I kind of just hop into our majors? 
So our first degree program is a Bachelor of Arts in Business Economics. Now this is kind of your more traditional business degree. We have uh, five different focus areas that you can really choose to uh, kind of hone in on and really refine your skills within those areas. Those are things like management, marketing, finance, uh, things like that. This program is really great because our professors, um, you know, they're often leading researchers in their field and they really care about giving you kind of practical knowledge that you can use outside of the classroom. So they know that you want to actually be able to use these skills in the future. So this is really important, um, I think, for our students, as this is the whole reason that you're studying uh, at university in the first place. Also, uh, students, uh, any of our majors, but particularly popular among our business economics students, uh, we do have a career center that can help you find internships as well. And, and more and more of our students each year are choosing to do internships as well. And we have a number of connections. So that's something that you definitely maybe want to consider within this major. Our newest major that we have is a Bachelor of Science in Digital Business and Innovation. Now, this is the only kind of degree program of its type available uh, in Japan at the moment. And we think it's a really modern major. It kind of looks at the intersection of the uh, business world and technology and IT. So it's a really modern major and really relevant for students nowadays. Um, so it's a little bit more math and science focused, so there's a couple more courses than that. So for students who are maybe a little bit more math minded, this might be a great thing for them. Um, of course, within this major, we have a number of different focus areas as well. So we have things like AI and deep learning, uh, where you can learn about artificial intelligence and machine learning that might involve some coding as well. We have things like digital finance and fintech, so studying things like cryptocurrencies and blockchain technologies, um, and even things like digital marketing and analytics. Uh, you know, big data is a really fast growing field at the moment. And so again, this can help teach those really relevant skills. Um, we also think it's a great program for any students who are looking to kind of, uh, you know, create their own startups, um, which is a really kind of fast growing field in Japan as well. A number of startups are uh, increasing every year. So this is a great major for students who are maybe a bit more uh, kind of, technology focused and will really give them the skills that they need to be successful in the outside world. Along with this program, we decided to partner with a global tech company. They're called Tech Mahindra. They're one of the largest tech companies in the world um, and, and the third largest IT company in India as well. Along with this partnership, we built an innovation lab with them. And they've been doing a number of things with our university, including holding a career experience practicum with our students. So our students within the DBI major were able to take a course um, that was taught by both the professor at TAU and the uh, management at Tech Mahindra. And so they were able to gain real world kind of advice and experience with these industry leaders. And it's really helped prepare our students. And it was just successful your students that you can expect if you uh, decide to join this major. Our third and final major is international relations, so a Bachelor of Arts in International Relations. Now this is for students who are maybe looking to understand you know how the world works a little bit more, how do nations interact, how do you know non-state actors kind of play into that, you know looking at the causes of international conflict or cooperation, war, things like that. Um, of course, within this area, we also have a number of different kind of focus areas. Again, so areas that you can really choose to kind of, um, you know, focus your kind of attention on and really gain expertise within that field. Um, and while many students within this major go on to do things like work for the United Nations or their governments back home, maybe other large non-governmental organizations uh, that you would kind of expect from this major, a number of students have gone on to work for large MNCs um, or work kind of for the international arm of certain companies because it gives them such an international perspective. And the great thing about this major is that it can be really flexible, right? It's really all about what you make of it. So we have international relations students who go through this major, move on to study IR at the graduate level, maybe uh, international policy or something, and are now working at a think tank. And we also have students who took this major, decided to do lots of internships during their time at university, and immediately went into the workforce and are now working, um, you know, doing like international PR for a company. Um, so there's really a lot of options within this major, and you shouldn't feel limited just because, uh, you know, to inter the international relations field, just because you 
shows this. Now, I did mention that we don't require any Japanese to enter our university, and we do not, um, but we do have Japanese language courses available that we encourage all of our students to take. We require one semester from all of our students. However, you can continue to take it, and you really can achieve full fluency by graduation. We've had a number of students who have done this, and it's really helped them when they've uh, decided to do things like job hunt in Japan or just honestly throughout their daily life. Um, but this will really help you, especially kind of after that first semester, help you with your daily life in Japan. Um, and so we also know that moving to a new country can be really scary, right? You can be really nervous about it. We know your parents might be worrying. So we want to let you know that we do have an entire office dedicated to our student life support. Um, so this is kind of the office that will help you with all of your daily life needs. So things like airport pickup, they help all new students open bank accounts. We can even put you in touch with an English speaking real estate agent for when you decide to move out of the dorms, um, who can help you get your entire apartment set up. Kind of the biggest uh, thing that we think is helpful from this department is we do provide um, medical and emergency interpretation. So we do have kind of staff on hand who can go with you if you need someone to go to the doctor with you or do something like that. So that way you can know that you kind of got that support there and available for you. We also like to mention that we have uh, a cafeteria on campus. One of our canteens is entirely halal certified and vegetarian friendly as well, because we know that that's really important for some students. Um, on top of this, around our campus, there's a number of restaurants and grocery stores that are also both um, halal friendly and vegetarian friendly as well. So you can know that you can get access to a lot of that during your time in Japan. Uh, we also just love to talk about you know, the clubs at the university. We know that that's oftentimes a really integral part of the university experience. We have a number of different sports teams for students. Uh, we have like, you know, soccer, baseball, as you can see, like archery and even American football. Um, and we also have things like uh, that aren't sports related. So we have like an orchestra or a hip hop dance team. Uh, we even have a TEDx TIU club that was started this past year that's actually been uh, holding events as well. And we're really excited to see where that goes. And we also have a model United Nations that was started entirely by our international students, which we're really proud of. They're one of the strongest model UN teams in Japan. They've won uh, the most awards at every competition they've gone to, and they're really continuing to be strong. Um, so if that's something you're interested in, we definitely encourage you to join that. We also have an enrollment fee waiver for any students who are looking to join the international relations major um, and have model UN experience in high school and are looking to join this team. So there will be a little bit more info about that at the end. Um, and another thing that's really important to student life is the, you know, during non-pandemic times, we have an international festival that's put on by both our international and Japanese students. And it's just a great way for students to share their culture, not only with the local, uh, with the students on campus, but also the local community as well. We, of course, have dormitories available for all students. They come fully furnished. We have a number of different options. We have a single and shared rooms. Um, they're really great. Students can live in them for up to one year. And we find it's a really good option for students, especially during kind of that either first semester or two to really give them um, a chance to settle into Japan and learn a lot about it. We also have a number of exchange programs. We find that many of our international students like to do a semester abroad during their time. And we have a sister university in the United States. It's a university located in Salem, Oregon called Willamette University. And we have things like a dual degree program with them as well as um, an MBA program that's associated with them as well for post uh, after you've graduated. So we have a number of different options for students looking to do things like that. Uh, as I mentioned before, we do, of course, have a fully functioning career center that we're really proud of. Proud uh, of. They do things like, you know, your standard career center, uh, career counseling, you know, resume prep, interview prep. Um, they also bring companies to campus to hold information sessions. They have a career fair, and they've often introduced students to companies as well who are looking to hire international students. We can support both English and Japanese job hunting activities. Um, we have a number of staff who are fluent in both languages, and oftentimes even more than that. Um, but the thing that we're really proud of is that for international students, we have a 95% job placement rate for uh, students prior to for international students. So we're really, really proud of this just because um, we know that this is really important to students. You know, finding that job is often really scary. Um, 
and can make students really nervous. Um, but we have done a really great job and we expect that number to continue to go up even more. Um, but if maybe, you know, that's not uh, maybe your path, maybe you're not looking to job hunt during your final year at university, students can apply for a job hunting visa as well uh, for up to one year. Um, and that's also through a career center. So that's something to consider. Um, in kind of the last end of my presentation, I just want to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, tuition and our scholarships. So as you can see, it's about uh, USD, about $12,000 to $13,000 per year at our university. However, we do have merit-based tuition reduction scholarships available. Um, now, these are applied for at the same time that you apply for admission, and I'll go over a little bit over the criteria in the next slide. Um, but uh, over 90% of our students are receiving some form of scholarship, and they come at four levels, 30, 50, 80, and 100% tuition reduction scholarships. Um, again, we're really kind of uh, proud of how many students are able to get these scholarships, and even something like a 50% scholarship can really help students um, in their overall costs at university. Um, and this, we also have that Model United Nations uh, enrollment fee waiver that I mentioned before. So if you're looking to major in international relations and have Model UN experience, that's definitely something that you should reach out to us about. On top of that, we'd like to talk about the JASO Living Expense Scholarship because we have an over 95% acceptance rate for international students. And it provides just a monthly stipend for your first six months or 12 months uh, during university in Japan. And it, uh, it's about 450 USD per month. So this is a really great way um, for students to really kind of be able to support themselves during that first year. Students can also work part-time in Japan, up to 28 hours per week. Uh, we find that the average wage around our area is around 10 USD per hour. And we also have a number of on-campus jobs available as well for our students. Now, going into that eligibility that I mentioned, so uh, kind of the standard screening uh, process at our university is we require, of course, your high school transcript. We require one English proficiency test. And then, of course, a personal statement. Um, there's kind of a prompt that you answer, and then a letter of recommendation, and then if you have any extracurriculars, you can feel free to put those in as well. Now for the English proficiency test, we just require one, so we accept IELTS, TOEFL, TOEIC, we accept the Duolingo test, we accept uh, the Pearson test, the Cambridge test, and then if anybody here is studying um, in an IB program or IGCSE program, you can also use either your IB English score or your O-level English score as well to apply. Our minimum requirement is a 5.5 on the IELTS for anybody applying for their first year. However, of course, um, you know, if you want to get a better scholarship, um, or in, in more a higher chance of admission, uh, it's better, of course, to get as high as you can on those English proficiency tests, as well as write, you know, as good of an essay as you can, and make sure that your grades are as high as they can be as well, as those are going to be kind of the primary things that are looked at uh, for both your admission and your scholarship, uh, as it is merit-based. Um, so just keep that in mind. And then finally, uh, you can just take a peek at uh, the key dates for our, both our April and our September intake. So for April, we've already had one application period, but we have one coming up next month and then another in November. And then for September, which I believe is the vast majority of students uh, are looking for, we have our first application period this November and then three more next year, one in January, one in February, and then one in April. Um, so I believe that that is it on my end for my presentation. However, I know that there might be a number of questions um, as well. So I can go ahead and start answering those. Thank you, Mr. Ben. Thank you for your enlightening presentation and guiding the students to consider higher studies in Japan. Um, we can now uh, look into the Q&A box for helping students with their doubts. Yeah, perfect. Um, uh, yes, so um, somebody asked about um, how many students get scholarships. So again, around 90% of our students are getting scholarships. Um, you know, they're getting, again, anywhere from 30% to 100%. Um, I don't know the exact rates kind of on which one, but what I can tell you is that, um, of course, the higher the scholarship, you know, uh, the higher kind of scores and things you require, but our average student is getting somewhere uh, probably around a 50% scholarship. So most students are getting something like that. 
Um, and then uh, people are asking about masters, which I should um, mention. So we don't have any masters programs in engineering or any hard sciences like that, just so everyone knows. Our masters programs are in international relations, economics, and digital business and innovation. And then we have PhD programs in economics and digital business and innovation. Um, I work in the undergraduate admissions team, so I can't really give too many more specifics about the requirements for that. But what I will do afterwards is in the chat, I will post the link to our graduate website, as well as the graduate admissions team, who I really encourage you to reach out to because they'll be able to work with you more one on one. Um, and they do kind of prefer to work with students more directly because each student um, is kind of so unique. Um, and another thing that I just want to mention as well is that um, we do have students that apply for our graduate programs who didn't necessarily study that in undergrad, um, and that's totally fine, just, you know, you need to be able to talk about why that is. Um, and that's also true of our undergraduate. Maybe in high school you studied more kind of math and science, but you're looking to apply for international relations. It's definitely something that you can do, um, and we'll be looking at that. Um, yes, so there is no, we don't have any electrical engineering, sorry about that, um, and we don't have any mechanical engineering as well, I apologize. Um, somebody asked about our AI program. Yeah, so um, digital business and innovation is the kind of major that you'll be under, and then one of our focus areas within that is AI and deep learning. So we have a professor, uh, his name is Dr. Kulkarni. Um, who is kind of the leading researcher in kind of AI and machine learning and like that. So if you're looking to study things like that, I think that's a really great major that you can go into. Um, yep, I'll be posting the contact information for our graduate programs um, afterwards um, in the chat. So if you have any more questions about that, please uh, refer it to them as well. Uh, we don't have any social work courses. The majors that I outlined earlier are the three majors um, that we have. And then somebody asked, what is the best for students from a computer background? So I think if you're looking to continue to kind of study, um, you know, maybe some programming or kind of more science and math related stuff, I think that our digital business and innovation major is a great program for students who have a computer background. It'll really give you a leg up and you'll really be able to kind of um, I think expand your knowledge even deeper into that field. Um, but if you're looking maybe to go into something like international relations or something like that, you definitely can. I just think um, if you're kind of trying to utilize that experience that you already have, I think DBI is a great option. Uh, we do not have an MBA program, which I can answer. And then for any questions about kind of the graduate admission process and courses, I'll be posting more information um, in the chat afterwards. Oh, and then there's a really good uh, question, I think. So somebody asked within kind of the six focus areas for DBI, um, can they only study one topic? Um, no, so you have, uh, within your major, you'll have a number kind of, of required courses, and then you'll have a large number of elective courses that you can take as well. So if you're looking to study maybe, let's say, uh, digital marketing and analytics, you're really wanting to focus on that, but you want to learn a little bit about, you know, uh, like fin financial technology, things like blockchain, you can definitely take those courses. You just have to make sure for any course that you have the required um, prerequisite courses, but for if you're already within kind of the DBI major, um, you'll probably have that. So no, you don't have to really limit yourself. You can kind of build the best program for yourself. Um, we don't have any elect electronics courses for anybody who's asking. Um, the DBI course, somebody asked how many semesters it contains. Um, so our standard uh, kind of program for any degree program is eight semesters for our undergraduate students. Um, and however, we do have an early graduation option for any students in undergrad uh, that is available as well. Um, but that's something that you apply for after your first year at university. And then somebody else asked how much marks are needed for entrance into our undergraduate program. We don't have any kind of hard cutoff for that as it is kind of a holistic application, right? We're looking at your marks, your English proficiency tests, your 
um, personal statement, as well as your letter of recommendation, things like that. So we try not to give kind of an exact answer. Um, what I can say is that um, for your English proficiency test, we do need a minimum of like, for example, on IELTS, a 5.5. And of course, the higher is better. Um, but the rest of the application is really holistic. Um, so there's no need to worry too much. Just do as best as you can and then work really hard at each part of the application. And we don't have any age limits as well, um, unless you have gotten a GED, in which case you do need to be 18. But there's no other age limits besides that. And then I think um, I think my time is up, so I can continue to answer a couple questions by typing. Um, I don't want to take up too much time, but thank you so much, everyone, for listening, and thank you for all the wonderful, wonderful questions. They were, um, I think, super important, and I really appreciate your time. Yeah. Um, Mr. Ben, there is one question from a student. Uh, yeah. Does TIU accept uh, exchange student? Oh, yes, we do accept transfer students as well. Um, so if any student is looking to transfer, we definitely accept transfer students. We have a number of students that apply every year, and they also can apply for scholarships as well. Um, so I'll post again uh, the links to our website and stuff. So please make sure to check out the transfer student application guidelines. You'll need to do one more piece of paperwork just about the, the current university you're at, but we would love to have you. Thank you so much, Mr. Ben. Thank you once again for yeah. your presentation and for answering all of the questions. And also I request you to please uh, share your contact details and other important information in the chat box for the reference of our attendees. Thank you very much. So um, can we have the agenda slide, please? Thank you. Um, now we'll have our next presentation by Yokohama National University. So let me give you a brief introduction about the university. Yokohama National University is one of the top public universities in Yokohama City, Japan. The university comprises of five graduate schools and four undergraduate faculties. For those who want to study in English, YNU offers 11 programs on the undergraduate and graduate level in the field of urban sciences, economics, business administration, law, and infrastructural management. So in addition, all courses at the Graduate School of Engineering Science are taught in English at YNU. Uh, now I would like to invite Professor Omori from Faculty of International Social Science to share us an insight into the university. Yeah, Professor Omori, kindly please proceed with your presentation. Hello yes. everyone. My name is Yoshi Omori. I'm a professor of economics at Yokohama National University. I'll be talking to you about our international MA and PhD programs as a director of the program today. Let me share the slide. All right, let me begin. Um, All right, first, I'm going to talk about Yokohama, then the university, and finally, the program. Yokohama is located in the central part of the Pacific Ocean side of the main island. A little south, about 30 kilometers south of Tokyo, and Yokohama belongs to Kanagawa Prefecture and is adjacent to Tokyo, the nation's capital. A 30 minute local train ride on JR Yokosuka line or Tokaido line from Tokyo station will bring you to Yokohama Central Station. From Haneda International Airport, you can reach Yokohama Station in about 20 minutes by limousine bus or train. With easy access to Kamakura, which is the medieval capital of Kamakura Shogunate, Hakone, a hot spring resort near Mount Fuji, and uh, Shonan, a beach popular with young people and families. You can enjoy the convenience of the city on the weekdays and experience nature on the holidays in Yokohama. Yokohama is also known as a city with an international port. Many people will remember Diamond Princess, but that's not all about it. The photos on the upper left and right show the Minato Mirai district, 
the waterfront district of Yokohama. There are many major air restoration historic buildings, restaurants, malls, amusement parks, museums, many tourists visit. You can see Mount Fuji in the distance in the upper left photo. The photo on the lower left is Yokohama Bay Bridge over Yokohama Port. I personally enjoy watching a huge cruise ship passing by under the bridge from an observation deck on the bridge. The photo on the lower right is the International Passenger Terminal of Port of Yokohama. From here, the cruise ships traveling in Japan, Asia, and around the world depart. Diamond Princess was one of them. At the top of the terminal is a wooden deck walk and lawn. The view of the boats and the city from there, especially in evening hours, is wonderful. When the sun goes down, many people visit the waterfront district of Yokohama to see the city lights. When Japan opened from a long seclusion that lasted about 300 years, it opened the port of Yokohama first. And you can witness the history of the opening of Yokohama. Many historic buildings of the foreign settlement remains in the city. Many international residents are found in the city. And it's not difficult to obtain um, seasonings and ingredients from abroad. Of course, you can find Japanese history and pop culture in the city as well. As for the climate, there are four distinct seasons with very hot and humid summers and chilly winters. Uh, fortunately, there is little snow in the winter. The Yokohama National University is located in the middle of the city on a hilltop overlooking the downtown Yokohama. Some students worry about tsunami looking at this picture, but you don't have to worry about the campus being hit by tsunami. The campus is built on a hard rock. It is even designated as a shelter for the local residents in the event of a big earthquake. The Yokohama University was founded in 1874 and has five colleges and six graduate schools. The economics department is in the Graduate School of International Social Sciences. About 100 international students study at YNU. YNU won the Japan Ryugaku or Study Abroad Awards in 2020. Uh, we won a grand prize in the category of national and public universities in Japan and the category of graduate schools. Now, let me talk about the programs. The economics department offers all English graduate programs, both at the master's level and the doctor's level. The master's level duration is two years, doctors, three years. We accept students in October. The application begins in September of the previous year. We offer three max scholarships, one for an incoming master's student and two for incoming PhD students. 
The programs have a very narrow focus, international economics and political economy or alternative economics, so-called, which is the reason why we have difficulty in attracting many students, unfortunately. Many of the faculty members in charge of the programs have doctoral degrees from either uh, universities overseas or universities domestic. We have about uh, 25 years experience in running international programs for the World Bank Japan Joint Scholarship Program students, which ends this year, unfortunately. Here is something that might help you evaluate uh, our faculty members' research. Yokohama University is unfortunately not a very top university, but it is among the top 10 or 11 universities in the field of economics in Japan. The biggest feature of the program is a small class size. For instance, this course, Macroeconomics 2 for the second year master's student, a taught for just four master's students in the spring 2018. This class, Microeconomics 2, also for the second year master's student, is taught for just two master's students in spring of 2018. The students come from various countries, as you can see. IMAP stands for the International Master's Program. IPHD stands for International PhD Programs. Our programs are very small, but the students' diversity is very large. Our students can expect to have future careers in government and private sector or continue on an academic path after finishing the master's program. After completing PhD programs, future careers in academics, international organizations, or high level government positions can be expected. So the recent job placement records look like this. You can see that many find employment in Japan after completion of the master's courses, and that many find research-related jobs after completion of the PhD program. But I, I think we had another graduate who has su successfully found a job at International Monetary Fund. All right, here's the information on tuition. In general, uh, tuition fees at national universities are relatively low compared to other countries. And here's the information on the first year's academic fees. Only in the first academic year, the enrollment fee is necessary. There are four dormitories of different quality and cost, as you can see and international students are given priority in, 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 in those. So the annual cost will be about this much in Yokohama, which of course uh, depends on each individual's needs. We have three kinds of tuition waivers, full, half, and 30%. And most international graduate students receive some kind of tuition waivers. And in addition, we have mixed scholarship or Japanese government scholarships to offer to incoming students into our program. And that is because our program is designated as one of the international priority graduate programs. The MEX designates such programs as a special programs to offer MEX scholarship. So uh, 
we give admission offers, then we give scholarship offers at the same time. So now we have three scholarship offers to give, one for master program students and two for PhD program students each year. The application is easy. We have a web application system and uh, you, do, you do not need to come to Japan to, uh, to get interviewed or to take an exam. Uh, Everything is done by document and IP form interview. Uh, no minimum GPA. Um, we have language requirements as shown. Uh, we accept not only TOEFL, PBT, IELTS, but also Duolingo recently. And GRE, quant quantitative uh, reasoning scores are highly evaluated. Okay? We do not use any other parts of the GRE. And uh, no need to come to Japan until enrollment at all. In fact, if you are to receive the scholarship, you're not supposed to come to Japan until enrollment. And uh, you, you do not need to become a research student beforehand to get into the graduate programs. Application fee is 5,000 Japanese yen. And our application period for fall 2022 admission will begin very soon. Uh, starting with the eligibility assessment period uh, on September 20th and application period begins on October 12th. And let me share also some top secret information on our admission and scholarship facts only in this Zoom session. Okay, so uh, okay, as you can see, we offer max scholarships, but you often see zeros like this here. Okay, that means we did not have any applicants who satisfy um, the requirements on age and nationality, residency. Okay which is the reason why we often fail in giving away mix scholarships that we, we are able to give. This is, the, this is for the recent years. And in the past, we have some years in which we fail to offer mix scholarships. We have, unfortunately. So, uh, we're looking very much forward to the application from excellent students in Southeastern Asian countries. That's all for my part. And let me try to answer some of the questions you may have. Misaksh, you are muted. Oh, so sorry. So sorry for the trouble. Yeah. So thank you, Sensei, for such an informative and interesting presentation. Uh, now we'll just begin with the Q&A session. Um, would you like to uh, answer any specific question that are there in the Q&A box? Why uh, is there any English taught, uh, English program taught, uh, Pro undergraduate program taught in English, I suppose. Okay, we do have one, but unfortunately, we are not calling for applications this year. Two, is there any pre-university programs for school students of the 10th, 11th? Unfortunately, no. Uh, how, to find, how to find professors? Is it through embassy? of the university for PhD. Uh, as far as our program is concerned, you don't, you don't need to find professors. All you have to do is to simply apply to our programs. You can see the faculty profiles on our website, which I will post on the chat space later. Does a university offer masters in business administration in English? Unfortunately, no. We have doctoral program in business administration, however. 
what is the process of application for PhD, uh, the web application system? And our website will show the details. So I will post the information later on the chat space. Uh, is there any courses for masters in business administration? I, I'm sorry, uh, uh, BS. Uh, could we have some information on the English? Uh, Is this it? I think I have answered all of the questions. Um, can I pick a few questions for you, uh, Professor Amari? Um, does uh, YNU have forestry related courses for masters? Forestry related courses. Yes, we do. Uh, we do not have an engineering faculty here. So um, I'm not sure if I'm answering this one correctly, but we do have graduate programs in chemistry and life sciences. Could this be it maybe? We have, we have master's program in mechanical engineering, material sciences, and ocean engineering, chemistry and life science, mathematics, physics, and electrical engineering and computer sciences, international development engineering, international infrastructure, and infrastructure management. Okay, thank you. Um, can uh, the English requirement be skipped if uh, the student have done bachelor's in English? Yes, uh, if the applicant submits a letter certifying his or her English proficiency from the school where he or she studied. Okay, thank you. Um, is there any master's course in transportation? We do not have a master's course in transportation, but uh, you might be able to study it under the infrastructure management program or in international infrastructure program. Please check our website. All right. Um, does YNU have MTech course, Masters in Technology course in Computer Science and Engineering? Yes, we do. Uh, we do have Masters in Mathematics, Physics, and Electric Engineering and Computer Sciences, where you can study the computer sciences. All right. Um, is there any course for MBBS, uh, undergraduate program? Unfortunately, not, not, not now. Um, I guess you have answered all of the, most of the questions. So thank you, uh, uh, Sensei. Thank you so much for answering the uh, questions. Um, you can please, you can please uh, share the important links and contact details in the chat box for yes, helping. I, I will. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. I think we can end the Q&A session for Yokohama University now. Um, can we have the agenda slide, please? Okay, we can now move on to our final presentation of the day by Japan Science and Technology Agency. JST is an affiliated organization to MEX. They invite young, talented people from different countries and regions uh, to Japan through Sakura Science Exchange Program in a collaboration of uh, industry, academia, and government. So let's understand about their offerings uh, through a presentation by our expert panelist, Mr. Nishikawa, an advisor for international relations and cooperation at Japan Science and Technology Agency. I request uh, Mr. Nishikawa to please proceed with your presentation with all of us. Okay, uh, thank you very much for having me here today. Uh, today I'm, talk, I'm going to talk about our program, uh, invitation program called Sakura Science Program. I'm sure uh, if you are interested to, to study in Japan in future, I'm, I'm sure you're uh, willing to come to Japan beforehand to see what it's, it is looks like. And I post my uh, slides. <clears throat> uh, this uh, 
And then the slide has to be taken down. Right? Uh, Mr. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah. All right. I'll share my slides. Okay. Okay. Uh, the program is called the Sakura Science Program uh, to be carried out by Japan Science and Technology Agency. <clears throat> and this uh, JST is a uh, research funding agency under the Ministry of Education, Science and Technology of Japan. <clears throat> we are one of the largest uh, research funding agency. And then uh, uh, this is the office, India office in New Delhi. Uh, actually, I uh, set up this office in the year 2015, uh, together with the University of Tokyo India office. So we were running the office together uh, in New Delhi, <coughs> uh, just north to the Beer Park. And this is, which is very close to IIT Delhi and Department of Science, Science and Technology and JNU and so on. So very, very convenient location. <coughs> So we do this, uh, uh, as far as India is concerned, we are carrying out some uh, research, joint research programs with uh, India. We are uh, funding such research programs, joint research programs. Like th this is just an example. Uh, these three projects are, are related to ICT pro uh, programs. So for example, this program, uh, University of Tokyo and IIT Bombay is working together. And this second program, uh, University of Tokyo and IIT Hyderabad is working. And then number three, uh, security, uh, internet of things. And then uh, Kyushu University and IIT Delhi is working. And some other program are also available with, we are doing it together with uh, India, for example. <clears throat> and then uh, this Sakura Science program started in the year 2014 but uh, uh, with India, in India, for example, it started in the year 2015. Uh, <clears throat> so I was, uh, I started uh, to work in, in JST India in the year 2015. So from the beginning of this program. <clears throat> so this is a short term invi introductory invitation program. So uh, the, the term uh, period for stay in Japan is about one week, maximum three weeks. <laughs> and then uh, uh, in the past, up to last year, it was uh, for, applicable for 40, only 41 countries of the world. But now, starting this year, uh, this is open, uh, this program is open to uh, any kind of world. And also, up to last year, it was only for the science, science or engineering uh, students. Uh, uh, can be invited. But now, starting this April this year, <clears throat> uh, we added the field of humanities and the social science. Uh, uh, so uh, almost any students uh, can, can be invited by this program. <laughs> and then uh, this program has a three component, but the last component is type one, that is, open application program. <clears throat> so that means uh, uh, we sh you should have a host or receiving organization in Japan. Uh, that is, uh, for example, high schools in Japan, universities, research institutes, private companies, NPO, NGOs, and other organizations in Japan can become the uh, host organization or applicant uh, of this program. <clears throat> And then uh, receiving organizations in Japan submit the proposal, Sakura Science proposal to JST. And uh, we evaluate the program. Uh, and if it, we consider it appropriate, then we approve and award. Uh, and then implement, implementation of the program is uh, by, by the uh, receiving organization will be carried out. And JST, JST will pay for the, the almost 100% expenses. So this, uh, you can come on free of charge to, to Japan and spend about one week or a maximum three weeks in Japan. Uh, uh, as long as and when, when, if you are lucky enough to be uh, selected by the applicant uh, or other receiving organizations in Japan. <laughs> so uh, there's an age limitation. It should be in the range of 15 years above and then also 40 years below and below. So uh, this program is meant for fairly young uh, generation. 
and he should be a very high performing student or aspiring talented student. You have to be a very good student or researcher in Japan. And then uh, you should be able to speak in English. Of course, you have no problem with this. And uh, the now condition number four, those who have not stayed in Japan is eligible. That is, uh, if you already studied in Japan for one year or so, then you are not eligible. But uh, if you just visited Japan uh, as a tourist, it is okay, no problem. Of course, you have to be selected by your school or by the receiving school or university, it's receiving one of the issues. These are the conditions are there. And this is just an example of the implementation by the University of Tokyo. University of uh, uh, Tokyo uh, was awarded, and then they invited 110 uh, students, computer science students from, uh, for example, IIT Delhi, IIT Hyderabad, Kalagpur, Madras. Uh, this is in the year 2019. They uh, stayed uh, about three weeks and do the, uh, the, some, some joint research programs in uh, University of Tokyo. <clears throat> and these are the names of the universities, which major universities uh, who, who uh, have already applied and uh, awarded uh, these programs. So uh, this is a number of MBTs which uh, these universities are already invited. That is, for example, number one is Miyazaki University. They already invited 757 people from uh, outside uh, Japan. And then number second is Okayama University, Osaka University, Tokyo Metropolitan University, Shibaura Institute of Technology, Kyushu Institute of Technology, University of Tokyo, Tokyo University of Science, and so on. So uh, all these universities are top universities in, in Japan. <clears throat> and uh, because uh, this program is limited to only science engineering students, uh, so uh, some universities uh, were not eligible uh, up to uh, last year, but starting this year, I think uh, the number of universities will uh, increase. The universities which do not have such engineering or science courses uh, can also apply for these programs uh, starting this year. This is a total number. This, as, uh, as I told you, uh, this, uh, this program started in the fiscal year 2014, and the uh, number of MVTs are uh, gradually increasing almost every year. And then total 33, over 33,000 people uh, have been invited by this program. And biggest number is from China, uh, 10,000. And the Thailand and in India uh, comes to number three, uh, 2,849 people already uh, invited to Japan by this. So, and then uh, those who came to Japan, visited Japan by this program automatically become the uh, member of Sakura Science Club, which is an alumni association of Sakura. So, uh, for example, this is just example, you know, uh, this girl, uh, she was invited to Japan by, by one of the Japanese universities by this program, and then she was uh, selected, uh, as she uh, became the university uh, student of University of Tokyo in the last year, and uh, another student among the same group became the, uh, it was uh, uh, successful in, in the entrance examination for the Hokkaido University, so two students out of this one group uh, uh, became the uh, Japanese uh, uh, students, I mean, Japanese students in Japanese universities, top universities. <clears throat> so uh, this is a, a, a alumni meeting in India, for example. This first alumni meeting was organized in 2018 at the um, ambassador's official residence in New Delhi. He is an uh, ambassador at that time. And our main guest uh, for this uh, ceremony was uh, Professor Vijay Raghavan uh, is a principal scientific officer to the government of India. He's a top scientist in, in one of the top scientists in India. And then uh, that time we selected a uh, uh, main coordinator for the India Alumni Association. So Dr. G. Tenda Chu, uh, he also visited Japan by this program. He's an assistant professor of AISA Pune. He's now, uh, he is the main coordinator of this association, that means the president of this association. And there are, uh, currently there are more than around 10 uh, coordinators working for him together, uh, working together. And the second alumni meeting was held 
in the year 2020, February, just before the COVID-19 started. So uh, this was held at the IIT Delhi campus. <laughs> so I'm here and these are the participants. And this is a, a ambassador, a Japanese ambassador here. And then a third meeting uh, of India alumni uh, was held only online, because, I mean, uh, on in internet because of this COVID-19. But that time also we had a very good uh, guest from, from uh, speaker, guest speakers from India. Uh, these two uh, speakers were, uh, you, know, you know, I'm sure, Pravasi Bharati uh, Saman Award receivers to, to receive us who are uh, uh, prominent professors in Japan, in Japan. Uh, of course, they are from India. So this is a, a picture. Uh, he's a, a top here, he, he's a Jitenda, Dr. Jitenda, he's a main coordinator and the ambassador of Japan, ambassador of India also participated and also Mr. Mr. Miyauchi of University of Tokyo, India office director, he also participated in this program. So the, uh, also we had this program in Sri Lanka, also Vietnam and Malaysia and uh, Thailand and also Indonesia. Uh, we had this uh, kind of similar uh, alumni uh, association meeting. Also, we had alumni uh, in Japan also, Sakura alumni in Japan, and also had other meeting also uh, this year, March this year. <clears throat> so uh, this program, uh, I want you to make sure the most important thing, uh, if you want to come to Japan by this program, most you have to be a, a student, or, or, or of course you can be a member, faculty member of, of school or, or, or a university, uh, because uh, as a sending organization. And then so sending organization must have a partner receiving or host organizations in Japan. So if you, if you are your organization, that is your school or your universities, do not have the partner in Japan, you start finding uh, the right partners in Japan. Because only the Japanese host organizations, they can apply uh, to this program. And then uh, we will uh, provide uh, the, all the funding through uh, the receiving organizations. So if you are a student uh, in, that, in your school or university, you speak to your teachers or the principal or, or your professors or vice chancellors and then and then, uh, persuade them to find a, a partner in, in Japan and uh, uh, let them uh, uh, to this program and come to Japan. I'm sure you have some time, one year is enough, you know, to find a partner and to organize this application. So. I hope you, I strongly hope that you, you come to Japan and see what it's like in Japan. I'm sure almost 100% of the MBTs will be satisfied you know, when they come to Japan and they want to come back to, again to Japan to further study. So uh, I, we are waiting for you to come to Japan by this program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Nishikawa, for such an informative and interesting presentation. Um, in case uh, anyone have any queries related to Sakura Science Program, please feel free to contact the uh, Japan Science and Technology Agency. Um, yes, Mr. you can look for Sakura Science Program on the internet. We have an English page also. Yes. So, Mr. Nishikawa, uh, please share the contact details of Japan Science and Technology in the chat box so that students okay. can... Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So uh, this concludes the webinar. Thank you all for attending and we hope you have learned and enjoyed this webinar. And thank you again to all the presenters today uh, for answering those questions and for the great presentations. It was a pleasure to have you with us. So just to inform you that in our upcoming webinars, there will be a lot more information pertaining to study and work in Japan will be given to you. So please stay tuned and register yourself to participate in our upcoming webinars. Uh, you can register from our website or you can follow our Facebook page for more updates regarding study and work in Japan uh, webinars. Um, Mr. Takashi, can you please uh, share the QR code? Yeah, so this is the QR code just for the information. You may scan this now and register for all of our webinar series. 
and if you uh, still do have any questions please feel free to shoot us an email i wish you all the best for your future have an amazing day work hard to catch your dreams see you all in our next session sayonara thank Bye. you